BC's forest fire season, millions of acres of forest go up in flames, and towns are evacuated, leaving thousands homeless. Firefighters battle temperatures as hot as a blast furnace. This heat, combined with thin air at high mountain altitudes, makes conditions seem like hell unleashed. Fire begins to surround you. You don't know where it's safe to go. Flames higher than a 10-story building can suck whatever oxygen is left right out of a person's lungs. It's one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet. In the past 10 years, nearly 50 forest firefighters were killed in North America. It will take a great deal of courage for these trained forest fire specialists to fight this relentless and very dangerous enemy. Kamloops Fire Center, the dispatcher has received a call. A smoke plume has been reported only a half dozen miles from the Kamloops Fire Base. But because of the rugged terrain, the site is impossible to reach by road. A three-person initial attack crew is being dispatched by helicopter to investigate. To be ready in five minutes when we're on the red alert, like right now. So we're gonna load up all our gear, jump in the helicopter and go have a look. These elite firefighters are the advance guard of the fire service. Their job is to hit hard at the fire while it's still small, before it grows too big to be controlled and threatens lives and property. The crew receives an update. Football field size, rate of spread fast. We better go. All right, I guess we better go. A lightning strike was all that was needed to spark tinder dry trees and undergrowth. Last year, this team faced their biggest test ever as they fought their way through the most devastating fire season in the province's history. Over a million and a half acres were burned, an area equal in size to the city of Vancouver. Last summer, we were evacuating people's homes. We were telling people they had to leave. We had fire that was spawning two kilometers ahead, and you don't feel safe anymore. In all, 50,000 people were evacuated, and nearly 400 homes and businesses were destroyed. But many more were saved. Despite the incredible amount of destruction, not one civilian life was lost, thanks to the speed and skill of the firefighting teams. Over 7,000 firefighters from BC and all over Canada responded to 2,500 separate forest fires. I wouldn't want to do it. They have to be very brave, very uh, individual people, have lots of courage, and they're doing a fantastic job. There's nothing more frightening to a firefighter than an out-of-control forest fire. With its oxygen-sucking firestorms raging at the temperature of molten steel, gobbling up everything in sight. What makes fighting forest fires even more frightening is that besides wits and instincts, there is very little else to rely on for personal protection. What every firefighter should be carrying is our fire shelter. Uh, you never want to have to use these. Every member of the crew brings a one-man metallic pouch of laminated reflective aluminum made to withstand up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It is meant to protect a firefighter from direct flame contact. It says it can hold it up to 500 degrees, but uh, I don't think the body can uh, survive that. In a recent forest fire in the U.S., some firefighters survived using it. Three, four survivors made it in them, but they got to a safe zone to deploy it, but the others weren't, uh, uh, didn't get through. The only thing that would put me in that kind of danger is if I knew somebody was uh, in need of help. Les Leduc, crew leader and 10-year veteran of the Forest Fire Service, wastes no time leaving with his team for the hot spot. The summer is particularly dry. 
So when even a trace of smoke is reported, the Forest Fire Service's response is immediate, just like a regular city fire department. On the other side of the mountain, a huge fire is spreading. The last thing the fire bosses need is another nearby fire joining it. I got a sounding from um, 7,000 feet this morning. It was pushing about 45 clicks, so... Les's job is to knock the small blaze out cold. But stopping the big fire will be a real battle, a four-round heavyweight bout for an army of firefighters. First, aircraft will drop chemical retardants to slow the fire's advance. Then, machines will cut paths through the forest to isolate the fire. And to starve it of fuel and prevent the blaze from spreading, a swath of forest will be purposely set ablaze. Finally, when the flames have died down, water will be used to douse hot spots and drown hidden embers. The crew is set down a few miles from the fire site because the rough terrain prevents their helicopter from landing any closer. Les surveyed the scene from the air, but he and his crew can still come across dangers in the forest as they approach the fire. Bears, mountain lions, falling trees and rocks, and lightning strikes are all unpredictable hazards of the wilderness. Yeah, you can check that we're going to walk into the fire at this time, and uh, just to advise, Ariel is going to sling our gear in, and then he'll be back to uh, back to Kamloops to get a couple of Canflex bags for us. We've uh, got a bit of a hike into our fire, so uh, and those bags are pretty heavy, so it's a lot quicker for him just to put it on his long line, and he's going to fly it right into the fire site, and then he'll drop it off. He doesn't have to get out or land or anything. He's got a little button, and it'll unhook. So all our gear will be waiting there for us once we get there. But it won't be a walk in the park for the members of the squad. Each of them must still carry 80 pounds of gear to the fire scene for over a mile. Uphill. It's a physically punishing job to be part of an initial attack crew. This load is compounded by an extreme heat of over 100 degrees and the 6,000 foot elevation. Imagine having a television set strapped to your back while you jog in a sauna. Forest firefighters must brave conditions like this before they even begin to tackle the fire. They're essentially extreme athletes who put out fires for a living. Time is running out to get this fire under control. The crew uses old-fashioned hand tools to clear a swath through the thick layer of flammable organic material called duff, right down to the inert mineral soil beneath. And this tool I'm using is a grub hole. A grub hole is something we like to use in Kamloops. Every bit helps, eh? This trench of exposed rocky soil, called a fire guard, will form a ring around the fire so it won't spread and become a bigger threat. Cutting fire guards by hand may look like 19th century technology. It is, but it works. Les and his team are not the only ones fighting this two-headed dragon. Over the mountain and across a valley, the fire services team have their hands full dealing with the much larger blaze. <laughs> That's a really big fire. It's been burning out of control for more than a day, and the danger to the nearby village is getting critical. Villagers are thinking about their own safety and preparing for the worst. It's been kind of, kind of weird, like, like it, I don't know, like it's that close, but it's up the hill, but it's all the way over there, but it could come, come down here, and it's just kind of, just trying to get get ready if we have to leave. The stress level when you're on alert is high. It's uh, probably more high for people that haven't been able to communicate. We've spent a lot of time setting up a communication system with our local radio, but there's still that worry that they may not hear the actual evacuation notice. And those are the people that are quite concerned because they've seen this fire, a fire like this come through in 71 that jumped over the mountain behind me unexpectedly, picked up by the high wind, and it completely wiped out uh, 18 of the native homes on the reserve just above the town, came into town, and there were people that had barely time to get out of the, their homes with their children. They couldn't take anything. Now, this is a distinct possibility. It's a deadly situation when a forest fire can jump or spawn ahead up to 100 miles an hour, driven by strong winds. At this speed, it could reach the town in minutes. Last year, a spawning blaze easily outran a fire truck trying to escape down a highway. The fire is about, uh, they told us yesterday, it's about, about four kilometers away, uh, but it could spread that four kilometers in about, uh, uh, in about a three hour time, so it really wouldn't take a lot of time to get here.
At the base camp, fire bosses meet to plan the firefighting strategy. Their plans are based on the fact that fire is a chemical reaction. It depends on adequate supplies of three essentials, heat, oxygen, and fuel, to continue burning. Like knocking out a leg on a three-legged stool, remove any one of these three elements and the fire goes out. They decide to drop chemical fire retardants from the air in a pattern around the perimeter of the big fire. The fire bosses hope the retardant will cut off the fire's supply of fuel and slow its spread toward the village. This must be done to make the situation safer for ground firefighters to go and fight the fire directly. Right now, conditions on the ground are too dangerous for ground crews to approach the head of the fire. With temperatures hotter than molten lead and heavy smoke making visibility and breathing difficult, it would be suicide to put crews in there. Fire is actually a predictable adversary, as it obeys the laws of physics. All fires move in the direction of wind and uphill where there's a slope. This makes deciding where to drop water and chemicals easy. The hard part is deciding when the conditions are right and how much to drop. The fire retardant used is a non-toxic solution of nitrate salts. It's actually a lot like agricultural fertilizer. The liquid is colored bright red for visibility. It changes the chemistry of the fire to slow combustion and won't evaporate like water, so it can be effective for weeks once it's applied. But it's expensive to use. A single load drop costs thousands of dollars, so retardant must be used judiciously. On board this small nibble aircraft called a bird dog plane is an experienced air tanker pilot. The man on his right is the fire control specialist. He is the eye in the sky for the fire bosses back on the ground. This morning, he's planning a retardant drop on the mountain fire. He has to assess the extent of fire and the direction in which it is moving. 2,000 feet up, danger is very present. Flying the bird dog is a tricky and dangerous job. The smoke makes visibility poor in an airspace that's already crowded with aircraft. Right now, there are a dozen planes and helicopters flying in and around a six square mile area without any air controller overseeing the operation. Very difficult for firefighting because we can't see what we're doing. We're having to uh, be really careful, obviously, for safety concerns that we don't put too much aircraft into the air at one time. That looked like a close call, but pilots have to get used to flying this close to get the job done. But any slight miscalculation could mean disaster. Last year, the only fatalities in the fire service were three pilots who lost their lives while on the job. Apart from doing the aerial survey, the bird dog's other role is as a guide. Incoming air tankers must be shown the safest and most effective routes over the site to drop their loads. The retardant drops are meant to hold the fire at bay, not put it out. The big message is we don't put them out, you know, our, from the air. They're put out on the ground. The hard work on the ground is what puts them out. What we want to do is buy them as much time as we can uh, to make sure that that happens. Knocking out the fire is the job of the ground firefighters, who are ready to jump into action when the conditions are a little safer. It goes up to the bush and wise off. The biggest mistake we can make in here is to get to get tunnel visioned and in uh, sort of a kill at all cost mentality where where there's a 2% probability of winning and we'll commit half the fleet to that 2% probability when over the hill or 150 miles away there's some fires that we could catch that that we have no aircraft available for uh, because we're, we're committed to a loser so a big part of, of the duty officer's role in here is to make sure that he's practicing that triage to make sure that we're we're losing in the right places and we're, we're investing the resource and, and committing the resource in the right places. These Firecat retardant bombers are the most dependable weapon in the air tanker command's arsenal. They may look old fashioned, but there aren't many other aircraft in the sky today that are as capable as these little planes, or that have as colorful a past. Built in the early 1950s, the Grumman S2F Tracker was a fast and nimble carrier based submarine hunter. After their work for the Navy was over, forest firefighting services discovered that the tough little planes were perfectly suited to aerial firefighting. 
Heavily modified, but with their distinctive bug-eyed profile intact, these Cold War-era Grummans remain unchallenged in their new role as Firecat retardant bombers, more than 50 years after they first took to the air. While the bombers are hard at work at the big mountain fire, Les and his crew start to land their first punches against their fire. Dina is working hard on the fire guard, but soon it will be time to use another tool, water, to cool and quench the fire. The success of the operation depends on a supply of water being airlifted to them. Thank you. Bye. Les calls for a delivery. Perfect. We're set up. Minutes later, the chopper is dropping a small portable water tank, giving the crew a waiting pool's worth of water to douse the fire. Water is heavy and difficult to supply in large quantities to remote locations. They won't get another tank for a while, so the firefighters have to use it at just the right time and place, and be very careful not to waste it. That's why their hoses are so small. This pump may be light and compact, but it's powerful enough to deliver the precious water supply to the crew's small diameter hoses. Uh -huh. By now, half the battle has been won. The crew has got the fire under control, so there's no chance it will spread and join the big fire. But still, they need to be alert. A minor accident or injury can cascade into a life-threatening situation because of their location. We're, we're pretty remote, but... There's always a way out, you know, if, the, if, if things go really sideways on you. We have to check in, like, every hour and a half. Whiskey 31 Tango Fire Center, go ahead. So they have a pretty good idea what's going on here. And if, uh, if anything does happen, we can set up a, a medevac via helicopter. Uh, talk to you again at 1,500 hours. Roger, copy that, thanks. If something happens at night, you know, you're gonna be on your own until the morning. So, I mean, that's always a pretty big concern. I mean, the job just inherently has a lot of dangers to it, so. And that is particularly true at this stage of the game. Alex is about to be reminded of one of those dangers. He's busy clearing flammable debris from part of the fire guard to prevent the fire spreading into untouched parts of the forest. The wood is tinder dry. A few burning embers can ignite the dry branches in a moment. While cutting a tree, Alex faces a flare up when brush near the tree he is cutting catches fire. But Alex is prepared for that possibility by leaving himself a clear path to safety. The crew could handle this flare up with their own resources, but with little water on site to spare, Les again calls for air support. The helicopter returns with a bucket of water to douse the flames. Each bucket of water a helicopter carries weighs over a thousand pounds, equivalent to a half dozen bathtubs full of water. These firefighters have faced some situations where escape was not so easy. Last year there was uh, some fire activity that I'd never seen before, like just, like if you can picture a huge tornado that you see on TV on those documentaries, storm chasers and what have you. It's, it looked just like that, just a big tornado of fire, smoke and debris spinning around. There were some times when uh, you're more or less surrounded by fire. Hairs on the back of your neck sort of stand up a bit. What's another big fear, Kev? What are we scared of out here, man? What are we scared of? Each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crews call ground firefighting doing the three Ds. It's dirty, difficult, and dangerous. <laughs> hey, we'll back out of here a little bit. The trench warfare of the firefighting world. But it's this backbreaking and painstaking toil that really knocks fires out. As Les and his team are proving, the visible flames are now out. Buckets of water dropped from overhead are great for putting out fire on the surface. But what's going on underneath? The squad must now methodically scour the ground with their bare hands, literally leaving no stone unturned as they search for the heat from hidden hot spots and glowing embers. 
That's exactly what we're looking for. Something like that, you know? Like that? That can cause you problems. An overlooked ember like this could cause the fire to reignite under the duff, days or even weeks later. Before we leave this fire, I mean, it looks good right now. I think I would, I feel pretty confident with it. I won't call it out quite yet. We'll give it a few days for that, but we can call it cold. And, uh, and I expect that there won't be any action needed to take on it uh, any longer. That's the helicopter that we came in. He's coming back. We've got our gear ready. He slung this into us, and now he's going to sling it out. And then we'll walk back out. While the small fire is now under control, the situation is far different at the big mountain fire. The raging blaze is gobbling up valuable stands of timber like matchsticks and getting closer and closer to the village by the minute. Now burning for two straight days, the fire is still too hot to fight on the ground, even with the help of the aerial drops of fire retardant. Now small gusts of southerly wind are pushing it up the steep mountainside. In this area, we're totally ringed by mountains, and we have two main major weather systems, one from the north and that area coming down, which has brought in the past some extremely high winds, winds that were knocking over trees, destroying whole areas of the forest, uh, the winds that were gusting up to 110 kilometers. Um, behind me here is another valley that comes all the way from Whistler and Pemberton. Now, if we get a wind system from that direction or that direction, we've got major problems. We had a meeting yesterday morning, and they had, uh, uh, they told us that we are on alert, and we won't have but a few minutes when they tell us to leave to get out of the valley. Dousing house roofs and tinder dry trees with water is the villagers' best defense against this threat. We're cutting down a apricot tree. It's right beside the house, so other than that, we're just trying to keep it cool around here. These folks may well lose everything they own. It almost feels like a dream or something. Yeah, bad dream. Kevin Matuga is flying a reconnaissance mission over the fire. If the mountain fire continues to advance, it will be Kevin's tough job to tell the villagers that the battle has been lost and they must leave their town to its fate. So what we're dealing with right now is about a 1,300 hectare fire. It's uh, burnt a lot of these valleys in front of us. You can see it's burned right up to the rocks. This is some of the most rugged terrain you'll find in BC. Mountains are extremely steep, uh, very rocky. We go from valley bottoms at uh, about 300 meters in elevation. Uh, right to the top, so around 2,700 meters in elevation. The terrain makes fighting this fire especially challenging. Kevin knows what the fire crews are facing in their fight to save the town. While aerial water and retardant bombing is spectacular for the villagers to watch, they pin their hopes on the firefighting work that's being done on the ground. Uh, aircraft doesn't put out fires. We, they're just there to hold it there until the ground crews get in. They can establish a control line around the flank and edges of the fire and uh, put the thing out. But before that happens, helicopters have to douse hot spots on the perimeter of the fire using buckets of water. Maneuvering in steep valleys to pick up water, these pilots keep watch for dangerous obstacles like power lines, which could snag their buckets and yank their aircraft out of the sky. We are now at the second stage of the battle. Though the spread of the fire is being slowed by the retardant, the crews have to start cutting a fire guard around the perimeter. They must be careful not to get ahead of the fire and be trapped in front of advancing flames. The head of the fire is still hot and very dangerous. Time is running out. The villagers may well be forced to evacuate in a matter of hours. 
we don't put our lives at risk for trees, we don't put our lives at risk, risk for houses, it's not worth it. Human life is, is valuable. To see somebody who's in danger and I've got to try to help that person, that's the scariest situation for me because you no longer have a choice. It's the third day of aerial firefighting. The bad news, the fire is only four miles from the village. But the good news is that the fire's rate of spread has slowed, allowing crews to make headway on the upper perimeters of the blaze. To cool the fire's perimeter, firefighters use the same type of small diameter hose that Les's team used. It's a technique that works, most of the time. Today, there's a problem. This crew is ready to spray water on the fire, but their main supply hose has been burned through. They need a water tanker truck in a hurry. New hoses are being laid. They need the water urgently because a sudden gust of wind could whip the fire up, forcing them to abandon their positions and retreat. A tanker truck finally arrives with a precious supply of water. Armed with fully charged hoses, the firefighters are finally able to get down to work. Now with new hope of being able to gain ground against the fire, the firefighters will have a better chance of containing it. Yeah, it's rank five activity up at the top right now. We're not gonna be able to stop it. So we're just gonna contour with it, strengthen this side, around across the top, and then when, hopefully when it dies down in the natural feature, we can shut it down. In a large scale version of what Les and his crew were doing at their fire, some of these crews are hard at work using heavy machines to cut fire guards through the forest. Hours ago, this was untouched forest, but this destructive looking fire guard will protect hundreds more hectares of wooded land and the people who live and work nearby. As the fire gets uh, larger, it creates almost like a, a snow cone. It starts at the small and, uh, or at the base is very small and it builds towards the top and it widens out as we get to the head of the fire. So we're just gonna establish control lines and, and uh, pinch off the fire at the head when we get the right conditions. Even at this lower perimeter where the fire's intensity is less, air temperatures beside the fire are approaching 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to sear unprotected flesh in seconds. Yeah, it's too hot. Kevin has been near the fire for less than a minute, but he has to move out of the way as the heat quickly gets the better of him. Yeah, that's better. His Use clothing is made of fire-resistant Nomex material, but he relies on good sense to not stray too close to the fire. The groundwork is going full swing and the firefighters are making progress. Despite the dangers, fighting forest fires is a choice that most of these people wouldn't think about changing for something safer. Steve Butcher gave up a secure future as a social worker for this adrenaline-fueled lifestyle. When I'm firefighting, I, I get to feel like I'm, I'm making a difference. I get to go to a fire and uh, I get to dig guard. There's something that I can do to make a difference. I get to cut down a tree. I get to call in tankers. I get to um, make decisions that, that, that will make a difference. And uh, in, in terms of activity, when I'm doing social work, I'm sitting at a desk and uh, when I'm firefighting, I'm out there. I'm driving beautiful, brand new Ford trucks. I'm traveling in helicopters. I am going all over British Columbia. And uh, I, I can't say social work is as exciting as that. If you can get into this job, there's something special about you. Everybody here, there's something special about them. They had to be amazingly physically fit. And uh, probably the most important is uh, if you can't get along with people, this is not the place to be. I don't know if we're adrenaline junkies, but we definitely are here for the lifestyle, I think. Like, there's some smart guys back here that are smart people that could be doing a lot of other things. These attributes have proven value in the field, where each fire season, firefighters face new challenges. Every day, they must adapt to quickly changing conditions and be willing to push themselves to the limit of their endurance. 
Firefighting, by its nature, is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. But it's thanks to a grueling selection process and top-level training that forest firefighters have one of the lowest injury and death rates in the profession. Safety's always first. That's the number one priority. Never put yourself in harm's way. Or you try not to, anyway. It's all about minimizing risk to live to fight fires another day. But sometimes, danger finds them first. Operating machines like this in these conditions is more than a little dangerous. Heavy equipment can sink into soft ground and roll over. But if fire gets too close, the operator should be able to move his machine out of the way. Unless something goes wrong. The Caterpillar's engine is overheated and stalled. The operator is trying to restart the engine right away. If he doesn't get himself and the machine out of there in a hurry, the heat from the fire could boil the hundreds of gallons of diesel oil in the Caterpillar's fuel tank. A flash ignition of escaping fumes could cause the tank to explode, trapping the operator in a burning machine. A bucketing helicopter on its way to the main fire is quickly diverted to help. Just in time, the machine's operator gets the engine started again and is able to escape the flames. This time, he made it. But to be sure the stubborn hotspot doesn't give the Caterpillar operator any more trouble, the helicopter drops its load on the flames. Ironically, at the other end of the fire guard, crews are hard at work, preparing to set a fire. The crews are busy getting ready for a controlled fire or prescribed burn using a drip torch. We're burning off the unburnt timber in between the, the fire guard that we put in and the existing fire. And this is the third round of the bout. This technique gets rid of flammable material left between the fire guard and the fire itself. It's a better method than laying waste to the whole forest with a bulldozer. In nature, small forest fires are actually beneficial. They clear away the buildup of dead trees and branches, leaving healthy, strong trees to survive. This part isn't burnt yet, uh, so we want to get this, this fuel burnt just to get it out of the way so we don't have to be concerned with it anymore. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to go back and forth across the slope just to get some fire to draw it uphill. And hopefully but by the time I'm done, this will all be on fire, so. But the success of prescribed anyway. burns depends on the skill of firefighters like Travis Abbey and his partners. I've got a pretty good slope here, so they should carry up there fairly well. To avoid any problems, Travis takes into account the slope of the land, wind direction, air temperature, and humidity of the wood, or fuel, when he sets the woods alight. More important than anything else, Travis always leaves himself an escape route to safety. Anytime we're going to do any sort of burning off, we want to make sure that we have water in place so we're, if something does get a little more aggressive than we want it to, then we can get off it right away. He keeps an eye on where the fire is burning. This is a strategy of literally scorching the earth to deprive the fire of fuel. It is better to sacrifice a few trees than to lose a whole forest. Or a nearby town. So ideally, in a perfect world, this would be burnt clean completely, right, right to the fire. Before leaving to work with a private logging company, Travis honed his firefighting skills with the BC Forest Fire Service. It's my 15th year. I started when I was 18, and it was supposed to be a summer job and turned into a pseudo career sort of thing, I guess. And, <laughs> yeah, it's good. I still enjoy it. It's great. Yeah, there's some excitement, and it's all, lots of variety too, which is nice. So that's fun. I 
the only real fear I have, I guess, is the stuff you can't control. Try to cool it off a little bit so it's not getting right to the tops of the trees. Just worried about it going that direction. So. But the fire is quickly getting aggressive. Despite Travis's skill and experience, this situation might be getting away from him. Quick action from above cools things down before the fire leaps across the fire guard and starts burning out of control. Helicopters are amazingly effective firefighting tools, as they can drop buckets of water on flames with surgical precision. It's exhausting and dangerous work for the pilots, who have to have unbelievably steady nerves and concentration every moment they're in the air. is an unforgiving vehicle to fly in the best conditions. The aircraft's weight and balance can change suddenly when the bucket carrying a water load equivalent to the weight of a piano is filled or emptied. This imbalance can lead to the loss of control and a crash. We've got three pieces of heavy machinery on this fire. Uh, two, two hose, and this area. Just to make the task more hazardous, dangerous gusts of wind and hot air currents caused by the fire can destabilize a chopper and send it careening to the ground. Night is falling. Grounding helicopters and the air tankers, even though there is still plenty of work to do to get control over the fire. If we don't get on it tonight, then I think we're going to, it'll be a tough go and a challenging period for us to get on top of this fire uh, uh, tomorrow. We'll have a, a, definitely a big fight in our hands. For the third night, ground crews will be hard at work dousing the base and flanks of the fire. Fire boss Steve Shell is in charge of the heavy equipment. Let's give it a good assessment before we put any equipment in there. Let's make sure it's going to be safe to work in that area. If you guys have any hesitation, we won't work it. He consults his crew of machine operators to create a plan for the next day's operations. Okay, what time can we start in the morning? Uh, I guess light around 6. Okay. Steve decides this time not to use the heavy machines at night because of the increased accident risk in the steep terrain. Like a weary army, the firefighters will use the coolness of night to try to gain ground on their enemy. They work by hand in the darkness, without the help of heavy ground machinery and aircraft. The next hours are crucial. With the fire moving more slowly and the wind stilled, the firefighters are hoping to secure the perimeters of the fire all the way up the mountainside. They hope to accomplish this before the heat of the morning sun gives new life to the fire. This is the fourth day of the operation, and the heavy equipment is back online, busy cutting the fire's access to fresh fuel. Nearly 100 firefighters worked all night, and they made good progress. It's time to assess the dangers lurking in these burned areas. But at this point, it is much too treacherous to allow the crews in to douse the smoldering embers and hot spots. Dead and dying trees, what are traditionally called snags, in green stands of timber are dangerous in themselves. But once you put fire through the forest, obviously you get burnt trees that are likely to fall. We have trained assessors and snag fallers that will sweep through an area that's been burned or an area that we haven't been in yet. And they'll flag trees or assess entire stands. And the, the hand fallers will go through with the chainsaws and put those trees down allowing the crews to go in. With the root system burning out on this tree, 
It's burning right now and it's uh, left to burn like this. It's gonna fall on its own. So we wanna make sure we clean this up before we get fire crews in here and come down on their heads. Even trees untouched by fire can be dangerous. Pounded by tons of water and retardant, trunks can be weakened and fall without warning on ground crews underneath. It's like working in a half-demolished house. Well, there's been a number of close calls. Uh, you know, one in, one in particular, a tree that was weakened by the same type of thing that we're seeing here broke off in the wind and fell towards us. And I ended up on the ground and the tree fell and it literally fell between my boots where I was lying on the ground. It was, it was as close as I'd want it to be. We have to follow these dangerous trees that have been marked by an assessor. Barry's job is one of the most dangerous jobs on the planet, lumberjacking. A moment's inattention could cause a tree weighing thousands of pounds to tip over and crush him. Add a fire-ravaged forest full of half-burned trees into the equation, and you've got a job that only a very few experienced professionals would ever attempt. It's fairly dangerous, yeah, because as you can see, most of these trees are all burnt out on the bottom or they're a dry snag. Like this here, the tree is over 50% burnt out, so when you cut into that, a lot of times you'll cut into it and it'll fall either way, uh, which causes a big problem for a lot of fallers. There's also the added risk of a horrific injury from the razor-sharp teeth of the chainsaw. You can see if you look at my stump there, and you see the, how the notch was. And if you look at the notch and the back cut, you see that tree is an exact line with my notch. And uh, that's the name of the game. These tree fallers have the danger of their job multiplied by yet another factor. Barry and his assistants must pay attention to what's going on over their heads or risk being crushed under an avalanche of water and tree trunks. This tangle of fallen trees was created not by fire, but by a single load dropped from a giant water bomber. Despite the incredible risks and dangers of the job, every youngster yearns to be a firefighter. 17-year-old Tyler has had this dream for years. He signed on for a work-study program at his high school that teams him up with the firefighters at the Kamloops Fire Center. Tyler was assigned to an initial attack team. He goes with them on every call. I would like to be a firefighter. It's very fun. They get to ride in helicopters and stuff. Uh, I'm in a three-man crew, but I was the fourth one. Um, and they, they love the fourth one because that's extra help, eh, on the three-man. It's great to have somebody who's like a rookie around. Been doing firefighting and taking out the flame and stuff like that. <laughs> we get them cleaning our trucks and basically doing the dirty work that we'd have to do otherwise, so we really appreciate it. Uh, actually, this is my first time doing work, doing, like, house cleaning kind of jobs. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Did I get anyone? Uh, he's eager, he's excited, everything's new to him, and uh, every experience is a fresh experience for him, so it's, uh, it's good for all of us to have that around. In only two weeks with the firefighters, Tyler hasn't had the chance to experience extreme fire conditions like his mentors have. So this is the standard BC firefighters. Um, Weather kit. It's a great thing about young guys. They haven't seen it, they're not afraid of it. People don't understand. They think that when they fight a fire that they can just stand there with a hose and spray. But there's embers coming in from all over the place that are burning all over your neck. You've got smoke blowing in from all the different sides. You get disorientated and you don't know up from down. You can't breathe, no more oxygen coming in. And uh, fire begins to surround you. You don't know where it's safe to go. Those kind of confusing conditions are, uh, are what scares the hell out of me. I don't want him to experience it, but that's the part of the job that he hasn't seen yet. Inside the Kamloops base, things are busy. Packs of equipment have to be sorted and prepared for the next mission. 
and food supplies have to be replenished. Bringing along a supply of tasty edibles is high on the priority list. Mm, energy. That's how we get through a long day at work. Chocolate almonds. Each team has to be self-sufficient while on the job, carrying everything they need with them. Just creating a little shopping list for them. So when I get out to a fire and I'm stuck overnight, I'm just kind of planning the meal that I'm going to eat. These other guys are giving us shopping lists because they can't be there, so they're trusting us to buy the right thing. Nothing too junky. With their gear stowed and ready for a call, these guys are set for a shopping mission, leaving their colleagues with plenty to do at the fire center. The crews at the Big Mountain Fire just got a lucky break. The temperatures have dropped a little, which could give the firefighters the chance they need to give the fire a killing blow. Yeah, go ahead and launch camels. The dispatcher has been asked to launch every available aircraft and send them. Launch camels to this ATR 3560. Back to the Big Mountain Fire. This is for Bird Dog Inc. and the Fire Cat. Bird Dog Inc. and the Fire Cat. It will be their second go at this stubborn blaze, which has been burning steadily for nearly four days. There is hope the attack would be successful. Temperatures are milder, and there's no sign yet of strong winds that would blow the fire in the direction of the village. There is hope the attack would be successful as air temperatures have been milder earlier in the day. Also, the expected high winds that would blow the fire in the direction of the village have held off so far. But a change in weather is forecast, promising hot, gusty winds and higher temperatures later in the day. This allows the air tanker command only a few crucial hours to give the fire a final knockout blow and stop it in its tracks. Every available aircraft is being launched to give the advancing head of this stubborn fire a pounding that must be delivered before the winds pick up. Look at all the information as we're taxiing out. Basically, we just want to get in the air and right get going in the, in the right direction. And 31 on the roll, 26. Okay, that was a bird dog there. He was yeah. beeping his horn, so they're going to drop some retardant up above us. Okay, have you in sight? Uh... Guided by the bird dog plane, the Firecat tankers and water bombers are dropping huge quantities of water and liquid retardant on the advancing head and perimeter of the fire. You're not filming this area, Jeff? Maybe you are. Touching down at a speed of 80 miles an hour, a walking pace for aircraft, this CL-415 water bomber scoops up water through a tiny six-inch intake scoop in its hull. It takes only 12 seconds to pick up a 1,600-gallon load of water before lifting off from the lake's surface. That's enough water to cover an entire football field an inch deep. Another water bomber comes in right behind the first. Any miscalculation of speed or distance could have disastrous consequences. But these pilots are specialists in the art of flying these big, heavy planes. The ground crews are also making significant gains. 
By the end of the day, faces look more relaxed in the mobile command center. There's good news for the firefighters and the villagers. We're gonna lift the alert immediately. And, and whatever it takes this time frame, that's fine with me. After a combined air and ground battle lasting four days, this final intense bombardment of the air tanker command has done its job and cooled down the head of the fire. In the next few days, ground crews will douse the remaining visible fire and patrol the fire guards. The villagers are relieved and grateful for the work of the firefighters. People will approach you and say thank you and thank your firefighters and thank the people that are, that are here to, to save us, which is evident by the signs you see around town, the yellow ribbons, the, the campaign that's there for support. It's, uh, it's a good feeling. One of the things that's never mentioned is how dangerous it is for them. Until you get up there with them and see them in the smoke in those helicopters and they're flying close to the mountains, close to the trees, trees are actually above them. They can't see where they're going and inhaling that smoke all day. It's just, just incredible. Now it's nature's turn to dampen embers and cool the parched forests. With the first real rainfall in almost five months comes the end of the fire season in British Columbia. The interior of British Columbia boasts some of the most breathtaking scenery in the world. But it's a dangerous beauty. a place where the most devastating and spectacular forest fires on the planet occur. And a place where some of the toughest firefighters around meet the greatest challenge of all, forest fire. Thank <laughs> you.